Welcome back everybody, Charlie Hogwood with Survival Dispatch. We've got another little training uh, session for you here today. We're going to discuss the sketched strip map. The sketched strip map. The idea of a strip map is that it's a graphical representation of a route between two known locations. Uh, the map is less about roads and more about navigational landmarks along the route. The map is going to primarily focus on the travel route, but does not provide a lot of information uh, to either side of the route. What we're looking at here is just what's on our route. Whereas a normal map is going to have information all over the place in depth, we're only concerned with what's a little bit on either side of the roadway or trail that we're on, and we're concerned with a full length. So a map could be many miles in length of the route, but maybe only a few feet to a few hundred feet in width along the, the whole process. Um, strip maps can either be sketched or computer generated. So in another video, we'll talk about how to use Google Maps to do a digital uh, strip map so that you can print those out and use those for like evac routes and so forth. But on this particular case, we're going to talk about the, the sketched out map. The sketch map is commonly used to navigate from a defined starting point to a defined ending point um, in an environment where the train has been destroyed it might be unfamiliar, the GPS is not available, and uh, di digital maps might not be available to be able to be used. So this really boils down to the old school way of having another layer of redundancy in your plans. And it also gives you a layer of operational security because it doesn't give you too much information all at once. The map should have enough street level detail for a person that might be new to the area to find the destination without any assistance whether it's on uh, foot or by vehicle. The strip map is going to provide you know, some following basic information with a sketch to show the general relationships of the key points on the route. So a case can be made to create multiple strip maps to account for route restrictions. So what does that mean? That means if, uh, let's say, you might need to use this map uh, post-disaster. A bridge is out, the roadway is out, the checkpoints have been established that you can't get through or don't want to go near. So you can create other versions of this to get to the same locations, but utilizing different roads or different areas. So the uh, alternates could be used uh, when supplemental evacuation maps of the primary route is compromised. So maybe if this is your primary strip map, you can create another one to the same location from the same starting point but have a different route if you don't want to be predictable. So you start really getting into the security of your routing, your convoy, whatever the reason is that you've created these, these route maps, these strip maps. So let's talk about some of the basic information that each strip map should have. Um, it should have a known starting point. In this particular case, what we've drawn out here is a starting point of an armory. Let's just say we're going to go, we're going to start from the National Guard armory. You have to have a defined starting point. I don't care what it is, for your house, uh, anywhere where you want to do your starting kickoff on this on this little journey. And you need a well-defined ending point. Our defined ending point here is going to be 321 Elm Lane, and it's going to be a blue house. So we're going to indicate what the house looks like. So the reason we want so much detail like that is, in my experience in dealing with major hurricanes and disasters, sometimes people that live in neighborhoods for 30 years and know every little crack in their sidewalk in that whole neighborhood, the water comes through, the wind comes through, and it changes everything. And they don't even know walking out their front door, it's like being on a lunar landscape. The street signs are gone, the trees are gone, the, everything is different. Towers are blown down, houses are flattened, and it's just not recognizable. You're no longer in context of your daily life where you got out and went and walked your dog, and now everything is different. So. Having this level of detail is going to help somebody find this address, whether it's the people that live there or somebody that you're sending for help. Now, the Army uses these uh, for soldiers around different, you know, around their uh, posts and bases. And the reason for that around the armories is because if a disaster happened and they had to go recover or retrieve their, their troops, each person would have one of these on file. Uh, in the uh, admin office of the armory. And then they, the uh, NCOs could come out and they say, okay, here, I'm gonna send out a retrieval team. Everybody gets to copy of this, go find you know, Private Snuffy. Here's how to get to his house. 
those people have maybe never been to Private Snuffy's house, and maybe nothing is recognizable now after the disaster, but by following this map, by looking at the major landmarks that we're going to cover here in a second, they should be able to get to that house and find that lost soldier. So we have a known starting point and we have a known ending point with an address and a description of the location. The um, road names and key cross streets are handy. Now the streets like we talked about, the signs may be gone. So I know that if I start out from the armory here, I'm going to get on I-10 and I'm going to head west. I know this is west because every, every strip map is going to have a north seeking arrow. Without the north seeking arrow, you don't know which way you're going. So make sure you have a north seeking arrow. Also a good idea to have a compass to go along with any map. So we're going to get on I-10 and we're going to get off at exit 385 over here. Am I going to be able to find exit 385? Well, if the sign is gone, maybe not. But I know that there's a truck stop on one side and there's a McDonald's on the other. And if I can see remnants of those, I can work with relative confidence that I can get off at this exit and I can, can call this Central Avenue. I'm going to try to find a sign if possible, but I know that when I get to the McDonald's, I'm going to turn left. That should be First Avenue. And I'm going to take it to the water tower or what's left of the water tower. It's probably not going to go very far no matter how strong the wind is. And then I'm going to take it and I'm going to follow that around on Robin Lane until I cross a bridge. And I'm going to say, okay, that bridge is going to be significant. Now, if there's more than one bridge on this route, you need to make a note of that. If it's the first bridge, the second bridge, third bridge, or no bridge, you need to make a note of that. And then I'm going to come over here to Elm Estates. There should be a big sign out front. If not, I'm going to try to find Bridal Path. That's the road going in here. And I'm going to make, an, I'm going to make a line for each street before the one I want to turn on. So I know that I'm going to come down past the first one, and I'm going to take my second right, which is going to be Oak Lane. Then I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to turn, and I'm going to pass over my first left, take my second left, and right before the cul-de-sac is going to be 321 Elm, which is going to be a blue house. That's the basics of a strip map. Now, there's a few more things that you can put on when you draw your own maps. Road names are important. Cross streets are important. It'll be a lot easier to do this on a sheet of paper than it is on a big whiteboard with a blunt tip marker. I'm pretty sure Nikki tried to use it to break a car window. <laughs> so, so that's why my marker's pretty bad. Um, key turns and exits are really important. So any direction change, the last thing you want is to just keep on going and miss a turn because it was not noted on the map. So any direction changes along the route and try to include a recognizable landmark that should still be there after whatever the event is. That's important. We also like to add the distance between the points or turns. So how far am I driving on I-10 before I get to exit 385? That's important. Is it one mile? Is it 20 miles? That's a big difference. So give the people an idea that I'm going to drive in this particular case. I might drive two miles. That way, if you're driving 20 minutes later, you can say, well, you know what? I think we went farther than two miles. Let's don't keep going. Let's back up and try this again. The phrase not to scale should also be written on the map. This is obviously not to scale. And the reason that you want to make an actual note of that on your map is because if I looked at this, I would think, well, why don't I just cross over I-10 and walk and I'll be right there at the house. This in reality is many more miles away. So what it looks like on, on the board here appears closer than it really is. And people might make some shortcut judgments by trying to do that. So right, it's not to scale. Uh, north orientation arrow should be properly noted on the sketch. We've created a north seeking arrow up here in the corner. It should be prominent and it should be obvious. And again, a compass will be very helpful for that. Because as you start to see, when you get into curved roads and there's a lot of neighborhoods or something here, you could be thrown off by the direction. In an overcast weather, you might not see the sun. It might be nighttime. You might not be able to use the moon for navigation. So it's always good to have a compass and a north seeking arrow. Visible, durable landmarks along the route for use when street signs are not present. So the water tower we talked about, that's probably always going to be there. Now, if this water tower has been taken down in the future, it is up to Private Snuffy here to update this map. It's also important that the survival group or whoever is holding all these maps uh, go back and check and update. Please update your maps every year or whenever something changes so that the information is current. 
the best laid plans in the world, and we see this all the time with survival groups, when the, when the data is not updated due to technology changes, due to changes in locations, equipment, whatever it is, if that's not updated, you're working from an outdated plan and that's gonna confuse people. So try to keep your foundational documents up to date as much as possible. Uh, total route distance would be handy. Uh, why would I wanna know how far it is in total? Well, if this is 20 miles and I'm on foot, how am I gonna plan my travel time? How am I gonna plan the gear to take along? How am I gonna plan for the fuel I might need if the fuel is limited to get to that location and get back? So you've gotta take those into consideration as well. So total route distance will help you in time and contingency planning. Town names are also helpful. The reason for town names is if you have somebody that's not local to there that you're giving this map and asking them to go do whatever it is you want them to go do, and they get and start crossing towns, if they get lost somewhere along the way and don't have a regular road map or something else, they can at least say, well, I saw this town two towns back. Maybe you went too far or we haven't seen it yet. So you can start to use that to also help with your situational position. Control points along the route would be helpful, uh, especially if you're tracking that team that you're sending out. So if I'm, if I'm sending out a team to go retrieve Private Snuffy over here from his home, and I've got them on radio, when they get off the highway, I can ask them to check in. When they get to the water tower, I can ask them to check in. And I can give these points names. I don't have to say out loud over the radio and violate whatever ComSec, communication security. I can come in and say, code name, you know, octopus. Well, that my, my drawing might kind of look like an octopus or an alien. So if I use that as a code name, code name octopus, um, checkpoint octopus, I can say, aha, I know they're at that water tower. I can keep track on the log. If I lose contact with that team, now I can send another team out and I can give them an idea where that team was last heard from. So I can track progress and keep, keep control of people that way, you know, from back at the uh, command post. So a strip map that has all this information is useful when a group needs to send somebody to retrieve a person or a family or friends after a disaster. And the map should be made uh, for any additional location of, uh, or, or person of importance. So I might have one from the armory to the house, to the house to the armory. I could have one uh, to grandma's house. I could have one to work. I can have one to the kid's school. And if I've got all of those different strip maps, now all I gotta do is pull out the right one and say, I gotta go get the kids from the school. The grid's down, power's out. I don't know what's happened, but I'm gonna go get them. So I can pull that map out now. And even though I think I know the way to get there, I'll be more sure by having a map to follow in, in times of stress. So multiple copies should be mailed, uh, should be made and filled out and distributed to everybody in the group that might have need to get to these locations. So the main copies should all be kept with the group leader or the team leader or however you wanna set your group up. And then they can be handed to the people already printed and ready for that mission. Uh, the other reason that that's handy is because sometimes groups might lose uh, communications with each other. The disaster might have rendered all communications uh, uh, useless. So now I'm going to have to do what we call self-deploy. That's not the ideal situation, but a map like this can help the group self-deploy to the retreat location or whatever the case might be. So maps should be updated anytime the location is added or changed. Uh, once a map version is updated, all previous versions should be destroyed to prevent confusion. Too often I'll see that people will create plans, they'll update plans, and they'll just hand somebody to the new plan and not retrieve the old plan. And now they have two copies. Which one is which? Which one do I use? Take the old plans and destroy those so that reduces all confusion and takes the, takes the, the smart people proof problem out of the equation. <laughs> so uh, maps should be limited to one destination per sheet. Ideally, I would not want to have everybody's, you know, one map that has everybody on here because that kind of comprom compromises a bunch of locations. If you're worried about that level of security, every location gets one map. If a, if a team needs to go only to that location, they don't need all those other maps. And that helps to keep those maps out of somebody else's hands. Depends on your level of security. We have a lot of people that start thinking to those levels and they wanna mind that OPSEC, so that's important. Um, 
Take your map to the next level by using waterproof paper. You can get right in the rain paper. You can go on Amazon and you can pick up right in the rain printer paper, notepads. Those are the papers that you can actually carry in the water. They're very handy. Uh, you can run them through a printer and do these maps digitally and just print them out so they're nice and concise. You can also laminate your sheets of paper if you would like to do it that way. Um, and you can also do prearranged code words for locations. So when somebody's reporting in over the radio, like we talked about, you could use code words for their check-in locations or code words for your objective. You can say, I've, I've arrived at Blue House rather than uh, the actual physical address there. Or you can write stuff on the map that doesn't reveal the truth of what's at that location. Uh, you can also, if you're really worried about the people that you're traveling with and you want to make sure you all get to the same location, you can take this map and cut it into two or three pieces and each person gets a piece. That means everybody needs to be together to use that map because no one person can get to this location without having all of the pieces of the map. So that if you're worried to get to that level of security, then you can go that route. You can also add in on longer routes. You can add in resupply and layover locations. Uh, you can do like, I know that I can resupply for water here. You can make a note on the map, water resupply here. Uh, I can find fuel at the truck stop. I can find uh, a resting spot somewhere out here behind the, the tower. So you can identify on your map all of those different little places to lay up and lay over and resupply as needed. So as you can see, the sketched strip map has a lot of uses, it has a lot of potential, but it is a very, very basic route only map to get you from a defined starting point to a defined ending point to retrieve somebody, to find some equipment, to bring them back, or to move on from there. And you can actually take and place another strip map at a cache location. Let's say this is the cache location, leave another strip map at that cache location, and then you can pick it up and you can continue on your journey if you need to go further. There's a lot of great things that you can do with these maps. It's just you're limited by your imagination. So until next time, this is Charlie with a, another interesting little tidbit of mapping. So check us out uh, at survivaldispatch.com. Uh, check out Survival Dispatch Insider Magazine at insider.survivaldispatch.com for this and all kinds of great stuff. I'm Charlie. I'm out.